The Senate approves possible energy exploration both on and offshore. Could the state school superintendent receive more political power? And the abortion debate heats up in Raleigh next. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. Hello, I'm Kelly McCullen. This week, the Senate approved legislation that could lead to onshore and offshore energy exploration throughout North Carolina. The bill technically launches a feasibility study, but it includes all the policy needed to get energy exploration underway. The full Senate passed legislation this week touted as an energy jobs package. It authorizes an official study of the feasibility of offshore and onshore exploration of energy sources, the focus being on natural gas and oil exploration, the money it could bring the state, and the jobs that could be created. It allows North Carolina to develop a comprehensive energy plan so that we can take the steps today that in the next 10 years we'll have a consistent source of natural gas, uh, either offshore or onshore, and uh, wind power and the like. The bill, if made law, would kickstart a 10-year process of finding and harvesting energy. Coastal County Senators divided on the issue of offshore drilling and exploration. Dare County Senator Stan White says he didn't hear enough answers, and his local leaders oppose energy work off its coast. Because of our tourist industry and my local commissioners are certainly opposed to this issue. Uh, there's too many things unknown, not knowing how far offshore it is, whether they'll be in the line of sight. Other Democrats argue that oil spills happen not so infrequently. So why risk it near North Carolina? This happens over and over and over again. It was not a single accident which occurred in the Gulf Coast. And if it happened once and twice and 10 and 20 times, it will undoubtedly happen again. Republican Senator Tom Goolsby represents a beach area. He says his area receives power from a natural gas fired power plant. He supports the search for natural gas under the Energy Jobs Act. I understand natural gas to be environmentally friendly. It's something that if we can drill far off our coast and if we have that kind of natural gas that is right there, a clean burning fuel, I mean, we would be foolish not to move ahead and try to do this and protect our environment and do it the right way. I've never heard of a natural gas spill. While the Senate floor debate centered on safety, energy exploration in North Carolina could tap trillions of cubic feet of natural gas, oil, deliver hundreds of millions of dollars to state government, and create jobs. But skeptics say, weigh the risks. Supporters counter, think of the reward. The bill includes consideration of biofuel crops, shale, gas, wind, and solar. Over in the House, the Public Utilities Committee has moved a bill to boost the recruitment of large energy companies. The proposed North Carolina Energy Independence Search Committee would be charged with reaching out to companies in all energy sectors. With all the international problems, we should now and cannot wait because of the unrest in the world, and especially the Middle East, that could paralyze our economy. We can't depend on Washington. They are loaning money to Brazil to drill, and then they will not allow us to drill off our coast. The Energy Independent Search Committee would be a three-person appointed panel with the House, Senate, and Governor getting one appointment each. The Senate approves new incentives for purchasing and driving electric vehicles. Owners of electric cars that are street legal can achieve 65 miles per hour and need an electrical plug to recharge could drive in HOV lanes during rush hour and not need certain yearly inspections. It exempts them from the emissions portion of the safety inspection. It does not exempt them from the safety inspection just obviously you can't test the emissions of an electric car. The electric vehicle incentives would begin immediately if made law. 
environmental regulatory board efficiency was discussed in the Senate this week. It passed legislation that would merge the various citizen appointed part time rulemaking bodies into one single full time environmental commission. Supporters say a full time board could better handle environmental regulation creation as well as oversight. The process would actually begin as a study that will investigate seven issues in determining if the state really needs a full time environmental commission. The House Agriculture Committee is considering a relaxation of hog house renovation laws. Supporters say hog farmers need some legal clarity before authorizing crews to rebuild and repair hog houses damaged by the recent tornadoes. The bill would allow reconstruction if the hog house's capacity does not increase and if it does not generate additional hog waste. The relaxation would allow renovations that possibly shift a swine house closer to homes, schools, churches, or hospitals. A number of bills were moving to make hunters prove they're allowed to hunt in places they're spotted hunting. The House Agricultural Committee endorses requiring all hunters to seek written permission of private property owners. Hunting club members would carry their club membership card and that permission letter, and law enforcement officers could ask for it on demand. Violators would face $250 fines for a first offense and possibly lose their hunting license for a year. The House and Senate agree on a new state health plan bill that lowers but does not eliminate monthly health insurance premiums for state workers and retirees. Governor Bev Perdue vetoed earlier legislation that would charge state workers and retirees monthly premiums. The House compromised and offered a free basic health insurance tier, but the Senate would only offer to reduce premiums for retirees while adding a Medicare Advantage program. The Senate position made up the final compromise bill. House Democrats say the House negotiators surrendered their chamber's position. House and Senate GOP leadership file a friend of the court brief in support of the federal lawsuit targeting the federal health care law. Governor Perdue vetoed an early bill that would have required Attorney General Roy Cooper to join the lawsuit targeting the federal law's individual mandate. It requires every American purchase health insurance or pay a fine. We think it's important to the people of North Carolina for uh, the voice of the people of North Carolina to be heard uh, in connection with the cases that are currently pending. So, uh, yeah. The Republican court brief backs the lawsuit jointly filed by 26 other U.S. states. Pro-life and pro-choice advocates are paying real close attention to House Bill 854. It would require women who seek abortions to receive certain health information an ultrasound, and then wait 24 hours before receiving an elective abortion. The bill received a House Judiciary Committee approval this week and appears headed for a full House floor debate. The abortion debate was renewed and heated this week in the House Judiciary Committee. For discussion was a bill requiring several steps a woman must complete before receiving an abortion. Supporters say giving patients state-mandated information an ultrasound and a 24-hour waiting period would make a woman better informed before proceeding with an abortion. In the law, we have lots of situations where you have to have a time period uh, after you receive uh, information. Uh, and, and there is an, an exception in the bill for emergencies, medical emergencies, that the 24-hour that the period doesn't apply. A few committee Democrats spoke against the bill, accusing the bill's Republican sponsors of injecting big government into patient-client relationships. Representative Alice Bordson says the bill isn't about abortion, it's about women, and the bill assumes all women are, quote, stupid and can't make an informed decision without help. She says women can't dodge the mandated abortion information in this bill without closing their eyes and turning their heads. And the information that's being provided to you in such a way that the only way that you can avoid the propaganda part of it is to avert your eyes um, is very troubling. That is what is demeaning and it's a condescending attitude towards women. The bill could receive a full house debate next week. The abortion consent bill would require parents to offer a signed affidavit before a minor child could receive an abortion. The 24-hour waiting period would be waived for medical emergencies. The Senate voted this week to specially allocate any money that's made from the sale or disposition of the Dorothea Dix Hospital property. The easy Senate passage guarantees that any proceeds fund mental health care in North Carolina. I offer this bill to you in, in the uh, respect for the long uh, tradition that Dix Hospital has has meant for people with mental illness. 
The Dick's property protections would take effect immediately should this bill become law. The House gave initial approval to legislation reforming annexation laws in North Carolina. The bill comes in response to efforts in recent years to temporarily halt involuntary annexation proceedings statewide. This House legislation would allow citizens facing involuntary annexation to petition their way out of the proposed city action. Cities would post notices of intent and hold public hearings prior to an annexation. The bill needs a final House vote before heading to the Senate. Barry Smith with M2MPolitics.com is here to discuss the annexation bill. Barry, who wins in this bill? Are, are the grassroots happy with this? Oh, the grassroots are ecstatic. They've been fighting for this for years. They've had study commissions. They've been looking at it off-season with, uh, when I say off-season, when the legislature's not in session. Uh, they, they actually had a bill a couple years ago that really did not meet their needs, didn't, didn't really like it that much. But this actually gives uh, people being annexed a direct voice in whether or not they're going to be annexed. This is something that North Carolina has not had for 50 years, and they're ecstatic. All right, if you're a local government, what are they saying down here? Well, the, uh, the League of Municipalities, which represents the cities and, and uh, towns, uh, they, I won't say that they're excited about it, but they think it's better than the alternative, and the alternative this year was a moratorium. They did not want a moratorium. On annexations. On annexations. Now, is the involuntary annexation moratorium legislation, should people consider it dead now with this bill passing the House, or must it make law? The, the moratorium legislation? Yes. The, I think the moratorium legislation was put there to try to make sure that, that we could get a real um, comprehensive bill <laughs> out there. Uh, let's just remember, you know, it's still only passed second reading in the House, still got to pass third. Should, should, that should happen next week. It's got to pass the Senate, and uh, it'll probably pass the Senate, but we're, we're, we're not there yet. Now, is a multi-page bill. Break it down to simple parts. How does it basically work if you're someone who lives just outside of city limits and the city wants to okay. come annex you? If, if the city wants to co come and annex you, uh, it, it gives you the opportunity. If you don't want to be annexed, if you and 60% of your neighbors, 60% of the property owners, sign what they call a protest petition, the annexation stops. Uh, no referendum, nothing. But it stops. They can't even think about annexing you for three more years. If you're a city trying to annex, mm -hmm. no way around 60% petition? Well, you, you always have voluntary annexations. Right. And a lot of cities and towns, that's all they do. So for most of those, it's not going to be a big deal. This primarily, not totally, but primarily affects involuntary annexation. Now that's where the city wants to take in a neighborhood and the, and the folks there are just absolutely against that happening. The involuntary, yes. right, right. Now, going forward, though, will people who are not annexed be enjoying city services and letting their city neighbors pay for it? Well, yeah, they won't be getting the water and sewer. They won't be getting the police and fire protection. Where, where cities talk about, uh, and this is, this is the point they've been making for years, cities say that people living just outside their city limits sometimes come to town, use city services in town, go to their parks, uh, you know, if they... They'll use their, you know, while they're in town, they're using the city police, city fire, that sort of thing, and they're not paying. And uh, yes, they'll be able to do that. Now, flip side of that is that if they go to the shopping center to shop, the shopping center is paying the property tax, and that property tax is more valuable than, than you know, a small house sitting on no prop, or sitting on a one acre lot. Very quickly, how does the, what are the prospects of this bill in the Senate? I think it's good. Um, again, the Senate has passed a moratorium bill and um, there's been a demand for this for some sort of change for years. I think the prospects are good in the Senate. Barry Smith, m2mpolitics.com. Search it up this weekend. A lot of good information. Barry, thanks for being on the show. Thank you. It appears a bill to help high school students get some real-world job exposure will become law soon. The House and Senate have both approved a bill to encourage partnerships between local school systems and local business and industry. Students could miss class to tour job locations, meet the workers, and job shadow. They can make up their schoolwork later. As educators, we know that not all students are going to college and we need to have them prepared for the workforce and they'll probably make a whole lot more money than some of us. Local school boards would have the authority to limit just how many job shadow days a student could use. 
The Senate has passed a new school punishment bill. It happened this week that covers all aspects of punishment as well as student behavior. It's a Senate Bill 648. It would require local school boards to draft written policies governing not only how students behave, but how schools can punish the students. Students would be told in writing the behavior expected of them. That written code of student conduct could then be used to punish students for behavior that even occurs off school grounds if that behavior could affect school operations. Those 17 school systems that currently maintain corporal punishment policies keep the option under this bill. Another Senate bill that targets corporal punishment passed this week, but not without a key change to it. An early version of Senate Bill 498 would have parents register their children for corporal punishment every school year. The bill that passed makes parents sign documents saying they do not want their children spanked in school. If parents do not opt out, corporal punishment remains the school's option. Some form of parental consent already exists in the 17 districts that use corporal punishment. Senate Bill 498 would simply standardize this process. The bill would take effect next school year if made law. The Senate passes a bipartisan bill aimed at improving public education. The legislation would create transition teams to help at-risk students transitioning from middle school into high school, and then once they're in high school, getting them to graduation. The 25 lowest performing high schools and the lower grade schools that feed that high school could extend their school year and lengthen school hours. What uh, we tried to do was to go through them and find out which ones we thought were the best and frankly which ones would not cost the state money at this point since we don't have money to really, extra money to apply to new ideas. The goal is to fund the 25 worst performing high schools for 190 academic days but State funds must be available to cover the operations. The House Education Committee is debating legislation to give more power to the state superintendent of public instruction while removing policymaking power from the State Board of Education. Republican voters, uh, Republicans say voters expect their superintendents to be powerful. Democrats say this bill may give the position too much power. The House Education Committee began hearing a bill this week to make the state superintendent of public instruction the leader of the Department of Public Instruction. Representative Brian Holloway says most voters think the state superintendent they elect is already the boss, but it's the governor appointed state board of education. Nine out of 10 or maybe even 10 out of 10, but we'll say nine out of 10 to be safe, believe that they are electing a person to run our state education system, or as we know it as DPI. Bill co-sponsor Representative Hugh Blackwell says the public schools deserve a clear-cut leader, not a figurehead state superintendent who answers to an education board that is not elected. They are, in a sense, electing a secretary to the Board of Education, and the public has no say in the identification of the chairman of the State Board of Education uh, who is instead chosen by the governor. The bill would empower the state superintendent while shifting the state board of education into an advisory role. Some House Democrats say this move would overly concentrate power into one elected position. This creating what I would call an education czar for the state is, uh, is problematic and I think it's problematic because we do have a system right now of checks and balances with a state board involved in policy and the superintendent involved in the administration of those policies. Other House members say they're open-minded to a stronger state superintendent, but fear the powerful position would be influenced by politics, not educational policy. The thing that I want to see is no matter who's in charge of education, that they are sort of a filter for um, the opinions of everybody who, who cares about education. The House Education Committee is expected to vote on the state superintendent reform bill next week. Committee leaders say the school superintendent bill will be voted on next week. House Bill 735 is on file to subject people on unemployment benefits to drug testing. Employers could demand and any ex-worker filing a claim be drug tested before the first unemployment check is issued. The benefits recipient could then be randomly tested as a condition of maintaining their unemployment benefits. The bill outlines nine drugs that testing would target benefits recipients. 
could appeal any positive test results. The House Select Committee on Tort Reform considers a bill to overhaul workers' compensation rules in North Carolina. Major provisions of this legislation would end workers' ability to receive lifetime disability payments under the Temporary Total Disability Program. Employers could receive reasonable access to a worker's medical history as it pertains to the job injury. It would also define the injuries that would constitute a worker's permanent disability. This is really about jobs and we want to do everything we can to protect workers, get them what they need, and get them back to work as soon as possible because that's, that's good for the workers, that's good for their families, that's good for the companies, and that's good for taxpayers. Nothing is down in writing yet, but we're very thankful for the opportunity to bring all the stakeholders to the table. The, both sides are working very hard to work out a fair and reasonable compromise. So we're hopeful that through hard work and dedication that the folks will be able to come together and get something that we can all agree upon. If made law, all workers' comp reforms would be active by this coming July 1st. A Senate bill would allow candidates in nonpartisan elections to reveal their party affiliation. Nonpartisan races by default would not show a candidate's affiliation on the ballot, but this proposal would create an opt-in provision as a candidate option. Unaffiliated candidates could choose to have the ballot reflect them as unaffiliated. It means you can put uh, whatever party you're registered with whether you're running for um, any of those nonpartisan elections. The bill would affect elections after January 1, 2012. The House voted this week to shorten North Carolina's early voting period. Supporters say the final week of early voting is always the most utilized time, so shaving the voting period is efficient and cost-saving, but other lawmakers say this will suppress voting. House Bill 658 would shorten North Carolina's early voting period by one week. Well, first of all, it saves money. It saves local governments money. It costs the County Board of Elections about $2,000 a day per election site. And I recognize that may not seem like a lot around here, but from where I'm from, for the local board, that, that adds up. Democratic Representative Mickey Michaud told colleagues this bill would hurt African-American voters because black voters vote early. Other Democrats say early voting encourages turnout through convenience. 16.35% of the African-American voters registered in the state voted in that first week, compared with 9.6% of the registered number of white voters. A glaring disparity between the votes was showing you the folks to whom this bill probably is aimed at. Republicans counter that having a long early voting period means elections and campaigning gets more expensive and that requires more fundraising. For the candidates who have to work for a living, which is most of us, you have to be out there at the polls for an entire extra week instead of doing your day job. On Thursday, the bill passed the second of three required House votes, 61-53. It sets up a final vote early next week. The bill receives a third and final House vote early next week. The House tentatively approves making felons of convicts who repeatedly commit misdemeanor larceny. Current state law allows thieves an unlimited number of misdemeanor larceny convictions. This bill would give that thief seven convictions before triggering a felony status that sends them to jail. The bill's sponsor, Representative Jim Crawford, says many other states will charge thieves with felonies after three misdemeanor convictions, but seven seems to work as a compromise for North Carolina. I think most of the law enforcement people are tremendously interested in it. We've had groups uh, in Henderson that go around the state and they steal enough money to keep it, uh, or enough property to keep it in the misdemeanor level. The habitual larceny felony charges would take effect this December 1st. A Senate bill would relieve out-of-state military members from having to get North Carolina driver's licenses while stationed in our state. If a service person carries their valid military ID and their valid or even expired out-of-state driver's license, they could legally drive in North Carolina. Service members who have had their driver's license revoked in another state could not drive in North Carolina. The military driver's license rules would take effect immediately should this bill become law. The bill has passed the Senate. It sits in the House. The House approves the strengthening of laws targeting drivers who drive with a revoked driver's license. House Bill 54 would mandate fines 
of at least $250 for a first-time offender, $1,000 for a second offense, and $2,500 for a third offense, with that third conviction being a strike three, leading to the convict's vehicle being seized. Now, this bill's not as tough as it needs to be. My original version had that after the third <laughs> conviction, they would spend six months in jail or under house arrest. But folks, we don't have enough prison space in North Carolina to put another 15 or 30,000 people in jail. The bill carries an effective date of December 1st. It still needs the Senate's approval. Law enforcement officers making traffic stops are protected by a law requiring all approaching drivers to change lanes when passing that stop. A House bill would extend that legal protection to any utility and highway maintenance vehicles that are parked with roadside crews on site. So drivers if you would see the maintenance vehicle flashing those amber lights, the move over law would apply. All vehicles, if possible, would shift over one lane away from the work site. Natural gas, cable TV, electricity, and telephone crews would be protected. The expanded move over law would take effect this October 1st and still in committee. Well, as you check your email and surf the web this weekend, find us online. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash legweek. If something's on your mind, email us, legweek at unctv.org. And, of course, this show airs on television. Of course, we also web stream it at unctv.org slash legweek. And uh, many of you are on Twitter these days. Our handle is at ncnlegweek, or you can search Twitter for my name, Kelly McCullough. And that's our show for this week. We hope to see you next time. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.